Welcome to Failing For You, where I'll fail so you don't have to, or even better yet, so you can too. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Failing For You. I'm your host, Jordan Yates, and today I'm telling you the story of how I became an engineer. This story is very interesting because I've broken it down all the way from what I think influenced me when I was a child subconsciously to when I was about 17 years old and made the decision to do engineering. So this (laughs) is going to be a very interesting episode because I'm going to tell you guys a very juicy story about my experience in applying for college and what ultimately made me decide which college to go to. This is whole story is something that only really my mom knows. So I'm going to be a little vulnerable today and tell you guys about my experience and get into all the juicy details. That way, maybe you can learn something from me and we can normalize the, the oopsies that happen along the way. So let's just get right into it, guys. First and foremost... The building blocks from my childhood that I think subconsciously drew me to engineering. Now, I didn't grow up thinking I wanted to be an engineer. I didn't know what I wanted to be. I think up until probably when I was, you know, about 17 years old and decided to study engineering, I wanted to be a psychiatrist or a psychologist. I really enjoyed people. Well, I enjoyed understanding how people worked and why they made the decisions that they did and why they acted the way they did. And I was very, very interested in people and our brains and just trying to understand them. So I always thought I wanted to be a psychologist. Um, Growing up, I didn't know any engineers. I never met an engineer. I never really thought, hey, this is something I could do. I had really good grades in math, but honestly, all my grades were really good. And that's not like a humble brag or anything. I just always had a really easy time with school and I worked really hard. And within grade school, I feel like having good grades is a lot more achievable than when you get to college. It's just completely different ball game. But back to childhood. So growing up, my parents were not educated. They did not go to college or have degrees or anything like that. My dad was a car salesman and my mom was a stay-at-home mom, but she also eventually had a side, or not a side business, a a full business where she made rustic decor and um, she also worked uh, some various other jobs throughout my childhood. Um, But needless to say, neither of them were engineers. When I was about 11 or 12, my mom remarried and she married somebody, which is my stepdad now, and he is a machinist. When they first got married, he was a welder. So as a welder, he would go out and he would build like metal buildings, fences, barns, anything along those lines. We lived in a rural area and that was his business. So to earn money as a kid, because growing up, like we didn't have a lot of money, I was very ambitious. I wanted to have that sense of security. If I wanted something, I could get it for myself. So at the age of 13, I got my first job and it was being a welder helper. It was the welder helper to my stepdad's business. And for a 13 year old, he paid me pretty dang good. So what we would do is we would go out to like his job sites and I would assist him in building everything. Rather it was handing him the tools when he was up high on a ladder or it was actually getting to like screw things in myself. I really, really enjoyed this. I also love that during this time, I not only was achieving my goal of making extra cash, but I was also learning how to use tools at a young age. This really helped me later in life because when it came to it and I was like in college and I had to hang something up by myself in my room, easy peasy, I got it. I know how to level it. I know how to use a uh, you know a power drill. I know how to use a, a hammer, nails, level, all of that to the point where all of my friends would also ask me to come to their apartments, hang up all their their pictures and whatnot on the wall. Anytime something needed fixing, I was the one they would go to. So I'm very grateful that growing up, my stepdad was able to teach me those very useful skills that I would use the rest of my life. So I say this story as I think 
the idea that I like to build things with my own hands and have that capability is something that planted the seed early. But this was only about the age of 13 and I still at this point had not even thought of engineering. Long time later, about when I was the age of 17, this is where I call the decision, where I decided I want to be an engineer. I remember it very clearly. So like I said, I wanted to be a psychology major. I thought that was the end all to be all. But then I had to get real with myself. How am I going to make money? How am I going to not be in loads of debt and be in school forever? How can I make more money at a younger age? And I know this may sound greedy, but at the time, guys, I'm telling you, like I was desperate for stability and for the ability to provide for myself because I wanted to not have to rely on anyone and I wanted to be able to put myself in a position to take care of myself early on. My brother-in-law at the time was a pumper. I don't know if you're familiar with what that is, but he worked in the oil and gas industry and he would come home telling us about, hey, have you ever heard of a petroleum engineer? And at that time I was like, what is petroleum? But he would tell us about how him and his dad worked with these petroleum engineers and they weren't even really like that, not smart, but they weren't doing anything incredibly difficult or engineering related, but they made a lot of money. They started off with, you know, starting ba base salaries of like a hundred grand. And to me, I was like, wait a minute, whoa, 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 whoa. You're telling me that I can go to school for four years and then make a hundred thousand dollars? Whoa. And I was like, okay, I'm really good at math. Math is just like, like something that comes so naturally. I don't even consider it a subject at school. It's just something I do. And I always tutored all my friends in algebra and pre-cal and all that. And I was like, this is like math and Jordan, same thing, same thing. So I was like, okay, that's it. I'm going to be an engineer, but not just any engineer. I'm going to be a petroleum engineer. And I was dead set on that. So being to the point where it's going into my senior year, it's time to start applying for colleges. Now in Texas, which is where I live and where I'm from, there is like only a handful of schools that offer petroleum engineering. Those are Texas Tech University, A&M University, and UT, the University of Texas at Austin. There may be some others I'm forgetting, but at the time, those were the main three. And I graduated high school in like 2016, so it wasn't that long ago. I'm sure the same is still true now. I needed to stay in the state of Texas for scholarship reasons, financial reasons, and because of the way that my tuition was being paid for by my stepdad's uh, military benefits. It was something called the Hazelwood Act, and so I had to go to a Texas school. So, comes down to deciding which school. Now, for me, if I'm going to a state school, this is pretty easy because I was in like the top two percent of my class. And in Texas, if you're not aware, the top ten percent of your class in any, um, and this is for like your your rankings with your grades, anybody in the top ten percent is automatically accepted to a state school. I, I think the same is still true today, I would assume so. So for me, it wasn't a matter of if I could get in, it was a matter of where I wanted to go. <sighs> okay, so this is where the story gets juicy. Now, I obviously had to tour the schools and let me tell you a little bit about each and what I thought about them before touring them. So initially, the University of Texas at Austin, UT, was the end all to be all. This school had a really good reputation, like this is where the smart people go. I prided myself as a smart people. I wanted to be where the smart people are. So I thought, this is the school I wanna go to. Coincidentally, I thought I looked good in burnt orange. I was like, this is where I'm going, for sure. But I should probably tour just to be sure. a and I don't think I ever ended up even applying there because I was like, uh, not really my vibe. It seemed a bit more like cowboyish and, just a little far and I, I don't know, I just never, I never had much interest in it for some reason. Uh, honestly, now I look back and I'm like, a and is a great school. I, you know, definitely could have made that more of a real option. But then there was Texas Tech University. And Texas Tech, eh, when you're in high school, everyone's very uber competitive and they're like, oh, you go to the dumb school saying like, 
their acceptance rates are really high. Like Texas Tech has like a 70% acceptance rate. The reason Texas Tech is like that is because they're a good business. Good businesses now, you accept more people, you get more tuition, etc. Having a high acceptance rate does not make you a bad school, okay? So if you ever feel nervous to pick a school because you think it's bad or it's embarrassing, forget that, okay? Just like think about what's best for you and what you like and don't consider like the social pressure because honestly guys, like at the end of the day, whose opinion really matters, okay? So these are my my options I would consider my real options. It was basically between UT and Texas Tech. The main reason I even considered Texas Tech was because one of my best friends from high school was going to tour there. And she couldn't really get into anywhere else because she had like really bad grades and she struggled a lot with school. Very smart in life, but like just school wasn't her strong suit. No shade, like whatever, she was an amazing girl. So she, was gonna try to get into their program there that was like a feeder into it. So me, her, and one of our other friends decided to go to her Texas Tech. At this point, I was not even considering it. I was like, oh, I'm just gonna apply here as a joke because the only dumb people go here, whatever. So before I toured there, <laughs> this is where the juicy story comes in. Oh God, why do I feel nervous to tell this? Okay, so this is gonna be a big failure in the theme of failing for you. I'm an ambitious person, if you haven't noticed by the fact I, you know, am currently an engineer, I have all my little side projects. I've always believed when there's will, there's a way. I still believe that, but I do know that sometimes the way needs a bit more tact. When I was applying at UT, of course I got in, because like I said, automatic acceptance, but I wanted to make a good impression and show my ambition. So before going to my official tour, I went on the engineering website and I found all the emails of the professors that work there in the engineering department that I wanted to be enrolled in. And I made a group email because in my head, when I was 17, this was a good idea. I would not do this now. Um, so if you're thinking about doing this, please don't. I made a group email of like, I don't know, 10, 20 professors. And I said, hi, my name is Jordan Yates. I am graduating at the end of this year. I'm gonna go to UT. I think this is an amazing school. I'm really excited about the engineering department. I just wanted to introduce myself, et cetera, et cetera. When I did this, I sent a headshot of myself because, you know, like I thought that's what you do. Like Jordan is, a lot of times mistaken as a boy name and it's even worse when it's in engineering. So I thought, you know, I like to usually have a picture attached because I want to be like, Hey, I'm Jordan. This is Jordan. This is what you're getting. And I just think that it's friendly when you're introducing somebody to give them a face to the name, or at least that's what I thought at the time. So I send this email like a week before my tour. This is where it gets bad, bad, bad. All right, so there's two parts of why the story is so embarrassing. This is the first part. I get there and I go to the, gosh, it's like the Office of Admissions or something, wherever they do tours. And the lady that's doing my tour, she sits me down and she's like, you're in trouble. And I was like, ooh, why? I'm here for a tour. Like, how can I already be in trouble? I, what have I done? Like freaking out. I'm very anxious. And she tells me that she like prints out this email and she tells me this is extremely inappropriate. Uh, basically alluding to the fact that I'm trying to sleep with these professors and that I, this was my like form of seduction. And I'm trying to sway their opinions to let me in because I'm sending a picture and I'm a girl. And like, why else would I possibly do that unless I'm trying to sleep with a professor to get in. And I'm like, excuse me, I'm already in the school. What would I have to gain from this? I just thought being an innocent 17 year old, I'm being ambitious. I'm doing what I think I need to do to get an extra edge. I want them to know who Jordan Yates is and I want them to expect me when I get there. This didn't go over well. This made me feel so awful about myself. She shamed me so hard. She made me feel like I was just this absolute like 
sorry for lack of better words, whore, and that I was trying to do something extremely like non uh, moral because I wanted to introduce myself ahead of time. So that was strike one of me losing interest in UT. I, I was embarrassed. I thought, well, I can never go here now because she basically went out of her way to tell me that I'm this awful, stupid person and then probably conveyed the same message to those professors. So I thought, you know what, strike one. Now, if that's not embarrassing enough, let me tell you the other reason I didn't choose UT. This is a little less controversial. This is more just straight up embarrassing. So the end of my junior year, I injured my knee in basketball. I fractured my, uh, my knee and I just, you know, stopped playing sports. Between the end of my junior year, middle senior year, I gained a lot of weight, like 50, 60 pounds. I was very out of shape. I was very miserable. And I don't know if you've ever been to Austin, <laughs> but it is very hilly. It's like uphill in every single direction you're walking. So when I went on the walking tour, oh gosh, I can't say this without laughing. When I went on the walking tour at UT, I, I was so out of breath and so sweaty that I thought to myself, how am I ever going to get to class without sweating? And for me, on top of it, I have really bad, I had really bad unmanaged anxiety at the time, and I'm an anxious sweater. So if I'm sweating a little because I'm physically out of shape and I'm about to go into a social situation, then my anxiety of about being sweaty is going to make me sweat more. So I thought to myself, oh my gosh, I don't know how I'm going to do this. I'm going to be drenched in sweat and gross and ugly every single day. Because to a 17 year old girl, that really mattered, okay? Keep that in mind. Fast forward a few weeks later, I tour Texas Tech. Like I said, in my head, oh, this is a lame school, poorly ranked, dumb people go here. I show up. The people that greeted me and did our tour, oh my goodness, the friendliest people I've ever met in my entire life, okay? I immediately felt at home. Now this is where it becomes funny. If you've ever been to Lubbock, Lubbock, Texas is completely flat, completely, okay? Not a hill in sight in this town. It was very, very easy to walk around campus and I felt this sense of relief. Genuinely, I think a big reason of it that I did choose Texas Tech, which I guess if you don't know, yes, I went to Texas Tech, Wreck'em Baby, Red Raiders, but I think the larger portion of my decision was the woman who shamed me and basically made me feel awful about myself for sending that email. And then the second half of it honestly was the fact that I was so out of shape Texas Tech people were nice. It seemed less intimidating. It felt like a more approachable place to be and an easier transition from moving from home in Fort Worth to, you know, four and a half hours away. It just seemed doable. So went to Texas Tech. And once again, yes, they had a petroleum engineering program and that's what I wanted to do. So that's how I ended up at Texas Tech University enrolled in engineering. Now, in your first year of engineering, you're in something called pre-engineering there. Pre-engineering is essentially you start taking all of your basics at Texas Tech and then you, at the end of the year, or once you get a certain amount of credits, you apply to your major. Now, once I got into college, oil and gas was very good, but I started having this contemplation of like, what if oil and gas isn't good when I graduate because if you all are familiar with the oil and gas market, it is very, very volatile. When it's good, it's amazing. You make a lot of money, it's wonderful. When it's bad, there's a lot of layoffs and it's really hard. So I was worried that if I majored in petroleum engineering, sorry, petroleum engineering, I would be pigeonholing myself. And if oil and gas went bad, I would be without options. So I thought of like, what is a safer major that can give me more options? 
Then I decided, what if I did mechanical engineering? Because mechanical engineers can be petroleum engineers, but not as often do petroleum engineers act as mechanical engineers. Mechanical is a very broad engineering major that covers almost every discipline in some regard to where you can really major in mechanical and then you can go be any type of engineer. So it, it was like the safest option. I didn't really consider civil because a lot of times it's like the rectangle and square thing. Like a mechanical could be a civil, but a civil can't always be a mechanical. Now I'm not speaking in absolutes. I'm just saying from my experience, being a mechanical engineer was the safest bet. So this was such a hard decision for me because I still wanted to be in the oil and gas industry. I was so, so passionate about oil and gas. And to this day, I still am. I'm, I'm a huge supporter of it. I really like it. And I have a lot to say about it, which I can talk about in another episode. But when it came down to it, it just felt like the more practical decision to do mechanical engineering. So at the end of my summer of my freshman year leading into my sophomore year, I declared my major as mechanical. Awesome. I go through school the next few years. If you guys ever want me to talk more about my actual engineering school experience, let me know. For me, it was, it was hard. It was very hard, but very rewarding in the end. Um, it's a long four to four and a half years or five or six, whatever it takes you. It's not easy. But it's really cool that you can have a full career after only having one degree and not needing any postgraduate degrees. So I chose my major in mechanical engineering. Now, something that will give you a bit of insight of the different jobs you could do would be some of the internships and jobs I had post-graduation, which for the record, very, very happy in retrospect that I chose mechanical engineering because when I graduated in December of 2020, there were no no oil and gas jobs. Like we were in the midst of the pandemic, oil and gas had fully plummeted, a horrible time if I were graduating with petroleum. Very, very happy I did mechanical. But anyways, back to my job experience. So in college, you'll realize grades are important, but they're not everything. What is everything in engineering is experience. But there's this catch 22 of nobody wants to hire you unless you have experience. So how do you ever get hired if you don't have experience? My method was finding a smaller place to start at and putting something on my resume that would eventually lead to a better opportunity, which it did. My first, I guess, like engineering job was for a small oil and gas service company in Lubbock, Texas, and it was an absolute shit show. <laughs> it was a very, very small company and extremely mismanaged, but I got a lot of very valuable experience. So I was technically, I think the marketing specialist. So I would do a lot between looking over like all the schematics and the designs of the, uh, what was it? We did like facilities. So after the oil and gas comes out of the ground, you have to process it. And then we would build the skids that everything would go on in like a modular way to make it faster for installation, whatever. So what I did there that got me the experience was just being somewhere that was considered in the oil and gas industry. And I learned enough to be able to talk oil and gas. Okay. So it was kind of in between Midstream and upstream is where that, that kind of company sits. Midstream is more the transportation of oil and gas. So like pipelines, trucking, et cetera. Upstream is the getting it out of the ground, processing it to be sent to midstream. Downstream is like the refineries of turning it into the end product. Once again, that's an interesting conversation we could have another time. But I had this job as a marketing specialist there where I would reach out to people like engineers that worked in the facilities, try to set up meetings, and then I would bring my boss there to talk to them about, you know, pitching our services. So that got me a lot of experience. I got to travel to Houston, to Denver, Colorado, and meet with just like numerous facilities engineers from really reputable oil and gas companies. So that was amazing experience. It really got me a lot of perspective on the industry and 
I would say something that was absolutely horrible is sometimes working for a small company, they try to make it seem like they have everything together and then they hire you and then they make you do a million different roles and don't compensate you for it. So it can be very stressful. So that was a bit of a, I'd say not a failure, but a lesson learned was be, com be picky if you can where you work and sometimes really small companies, it could be hit or miss. So just try to do your research, but know if it comes to the point where you need to quit because it's no longer aligned with your interest, it's okay. They're gonna try to guilt you to stay and make it feel like you're responsible for their success or failures. And it's sad, but like at the end of the day, you have to look out for yourself. So if you put yourself in a situation like that and you do your best you can and you realize like this is not good for me, it's okay to leave. So I did that for about eight months. And then I got, I guess, so that was like my sophomore, junior year. And then that year I went to the engineering job fair and I got an internship for the summer of 2019 at someone that was called Incana Oil and Gas, or now Oventive, which is an upstream oil and gas operator and best, best internship ever. One, they paid amazing. Two, they moved me to Denver, Colorado for the summer. Such an amazing experience, such a great company, and I learned so, so much. So even as a mechanical engineer, I went and worked as a reservoir engineering intern. A lot of times they say you can't do reservoir unless you're petroleum. Well, I was a mechanical doing reservoir, so you can, okay? Myth busted. <laughs> So I did that for the summer, had a great time there. Um, in between quitting the other job and waiting for that internship to start though, in the spring semester, I worked for a water pump company. It was called Grunfoss slash Peerless Pumps. That was good experience because I actually got to like get my hands dirty and help with building and testing the water pumps. Very cool experience. The guys on the floor were very impressed that I knew how to use power tools. So really came full circle from when I was 13 working with my stepdad all the way to actually having a real job and using those skills I had. So that made me more valuable in a position like that. But I also got to do the service side, which was more like a sales position and calling customers. So I can get more into like my actual career experiences at another time. I'm just trying to give you a quick overview of like snippets of the jobs I did by having the mechanical engineering degree and what led me to where I am now. So I did that. Then I got a return offer at my oil and gas internship, the Encana one for summer 2020. 2020 comes around. <laughs> As you remember, there was this wee thing called a pandemic and it was not a good time to go live somewhere else. So they canceled over internships, but they were such a good company that they cut us all a $5,000 check to be like, I know you were relying on the money this summer. Here you go. We're so sorry. Like they didn't have to do that. And that was amazing that they did. Another reason I love this company. And also while I was in I guess it was like my junior and senior-ish year. I can't remember the exact years. I think it was like 2019 to 2020. I was also a teaching assistant for an electrical engineering class, just the general one that all non-majors did. That was fun. Um, but I also like was really bad at electrical engineering and I don't know how I ended up in that role. I, my professor went out of his way to ask me and I still to this day don't understand why, but sometimes, you know, things just happen and we make the best of them. I needed a job, so I took it. Fast forward to fall semester of 2020 and it's the engineering job fair again and it's going to be online because <laughs> pandemic. So we do our job fair and oil and gas is still not hiring. It was a very, very rough time for oil and gas still. And then I ended up taking a job as a sales engineer at an automation and controls distribution and integration company. This is how I ended up in manufacturing. I told the full juicy story on the Automation Ladies podcast. So if you want to hear about my experience of working for that company and the horrific hiring process, go listen to them. They are amazing. Had a fun episode. 
back to the storyline. So I worked there for a little over a year. And within this job, I went to like 20 different factories a week. So anything from watching how a trash bag gets made to seeing how like a um, air conditioning unit is manufactured from scratch. My job was to sell them the automation and electrical components so their machines would work. And so I got to get a lot of hands-on experience of demoing products, um, helping them solve problems when their machines weren't working, working with our field service guys, really good experience, really good exposure to the manufacturing industry because I got to see almost every different type of manufacturer there was within the Texas area. Like I went to like over a hundred different manufacturers. It was really cool. And that's why I love the manufacturing industry and still am in it. Then for many, many reasons, I decided at the beginning of 2022, I needed a change. So I got a job in February of where I am now. And I currently work for a ceramic capacitor manufacturer. I love my job here. First off, because it is remote. I love working from home. It's really, really nice. It's really cushy. I get to hang out with my dogs all day. I get to just have a more, I don't know, I guess a lifestyle that's, it's a bit more similar to like my priorities. Like I, I don't feel too worn out to go to the gym at night. I don't feel worn out from commuting every day. For so many reasons, I love working from home. But for my actual job duties, what I do now is a job I didn't even know existed when I was in college. I'm called a marketing engineer. So I work in the marketing department and essentially my job is to do applications research on where our specialty ceramic capacitors go. So basically I just do research all day, every day, take my findings, present them to the team and then help enable the content side like what, like I get paid to research engineering. This is amazing. And I, I'm telling you best job ever. I'm constantly getting people trying to offer me jobs and I'm like, please don't, please don't. I love my job. I'm not leaving. Like you cannot pay me enough to leave. Okay. Like I love my job and I know that's pretty rare. So I'm very, very grateful, like beyond grateful. And I know I have a good thing, but on top of that, it also gives me time to do stuff like this, podcasting, YouTube channel, and I'm starting back into my side business. So my side business, what I do, I incorporated an LLC with my partner called Tex Media. Back about a year ago, I had people reaching out to me asking me to make demo videos of their manufacturing related products. Now, why becoming this sort of engineer is interesting is because when you work on your social skills and your presentability skills, and you also have the technical knowledge and you know how to bridge the gap between those who are really, really technical and those who are not and help create the story in between. When you're able to make a seamless communication between the two to where both sides feel understood and appreciated, there's a market for that. So on the side, I like to do my YouTube channel where I'll do either fun engineering demos, concepts, my video version of this podcast, or some other related things. We're back in early days again, we're growing. I just had my first paid partnership this week with a company called Robotis, AKA Robot Is, is how it said, or Dynamixel. They do mini robots, actuators, all of that. And the reason that they paid me to promote their product is because for one, I accepted it because it is in line with something that I like. It's in line with my industry. I'm an actual engineer and I enjoy the automation and controls robotics type products. And I have a type of following that's interested in it. So it's just things like this that can branch out of having an engineering degree that I didn't even know was something that would come out of it. So when I'm telling you how I became an engineer, if you want to know more about my actual engineering career, that's going to be a whole other podcast. I wanted to tell you guys all the fun, nitty gritty details and failures I had along the way to actually getting to where I am today. And a lot of that, like I said, started as a kid, then eventually into high school and then into making the decision of where to go to college, 
getting through college and then eventually being in my career. I feel like my career is the more interesting aspect, but a lot of people are interested, like, how did you even get into engineering? It's like, especially as a girl, because we know that that's not the most popular route for girls. So how did a young girl decide, I want to become an engineer? It's an interesting story. So that's why I decided to tell it to you all. And just a few of the mistakes I've made along the way, some things I learned, and what you could consider a failure here and there, but most of all, lessons learned. I'm very happy where I am today in my career. I'm excited to see what's to come next in terms of my side business and my social media platforms. That is all in the works. But I have said enough for today. If you guys want to hear about some other things and topics of engineering and career related, let me know right into the podcast. Our next segment typically, like I've said before, is going to be failures, lessons, and questions. This will be where you write in and tell us either about somewhere where you failed, a lesson you learned, or maybe just a question you have for me or one of our guests. Nobody has written in. I will only give you guys a break because it is only episode three, so I don't expect anyone to write in yet, but I am reminding you this will be a segment soon. But in the meantime, I'm your host, Jordan Yates, and I'll be failing for you. See you next time.